And the first thing that we always do is acknowledge the land and the people who were here before we were. We begin by acknowledging that we are gathered in the homeland of the Salish and Kalispa people. That is Salish for Kalispell. We are committed to respectfully sharing the history and contemporary culture of the indigenous people who lived and traveled through this land. We learn from many indigenous artists, elders, and organizations. We invite you to learn and support them as well. And I'm happy to, I already introduced myself, so I'm happy to introduce Sadie Pion, <coughs> who is the, stops, sorry, who is the director of the Salish Kalispell Cultural Committee, a department of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. She served the Cultural Committee as historical collections manager once. Oh, sorry, since 2002. Thompson Smith, who has been entertaining you, is the Culture Committee's historian and ethnographer. He is served, has served in that capacity since 1991. As they will explain, the Culture Committee's mission under the guidance and direction of the Elders Cultural Advisory Council is to educate both tribal members and the public about the culture, language, and history of the Salish and Kalispell people. So without further ado, I'm going to give this to Sadie, and we're going to hope that it lasts for however long we need it to last. <coughs> Let me know if I'm not loud enough. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Sadie Pion Stops, as BJ mentioned, and I'm the new director um, for the Sedlish Cudley Spag Culture Committee. Um, our past director, Tony Kashola, served us for 47 years at the Culture Committee and for 27, 27 as director. Um, and I had the pleasure of working alongside him for the last 20 years and, and Thompson for much, much longer than that. Um, but I'm, I'm new in this capacity, so bear with me. Um, but we're going to give you, I'm going to give you a little introduction about what our program is about this morning. Um, and then Thompson's going to go into the history of the Salish and, and Cudley's Bed people. Um, and as... Uh, Dave Strohmeyer mentioned last night, I don't know if you, you all were here last night for the opening with Shirley Trahan, um, Mayor Jordan Hess, and Commissioner Dave Strohmeyer. Um, the history of this place goes back a long, long ways, much, much farther than Lewis and Clark's arrival to this area. Um, and I also wanted to say welcome to the homeland of the Salish and Cudley Spud people, primarily the Salish people. Um, known as Inthai, Inthai Tsin, also is the longer version, and that's place of the small bull trout in our language. Um, so our program began in the mid-1974, um, 1975. There was a small grant written, um, and it was out of the college, but in conjunction with the Two Eagle River School, which is a all-tribal high school. And at the time, there was a, a component, a cultural component that needed to be written into this, this grant. And they thought, what the heck does that mean? What is that? What does that look like? How are we going to do that? Um, and they hired Johnny R. Lee on the far, your far right, um, as the kind of facilitator who then became the first director of the culture committee. Also, at the same time, there was a recognition of um, a change in time and a change that our elders here saw um, of the urgent need of our language and history and culture that needed to be protected and um, perpetuated and there needed to be some education within our, our, our tribal membership. So they formed the Elders Advisory Council which was made up of knowledgeable tribal elders um, fluent speaking elders. And like I said, Johnny R. Lee was the first director. Later, um, he hired Clarence Woodcock as, I believe, like a co director. And he 
then became the second director of the Culture Committee, which then led into Tony Ipashola, my predecessor, as the third director, which I said served as director for over 20, 20 years. Um, these elders here served for many, many years on the Elders Advisory Council, and all of our work that we do at the Culture Committee is vetted through the body of our Elders Advisory Council, and they are still very strong today. We, we make sure that whatever we produce and whatever work that we do out of our office is vetted through them for accuracy. And I also wanted to say that um, the elders there, amongst many others, and you'll see some here on the walls, and you'll see a slide here, here in a little bit, um, that has some of the other elders and ancestors that contributed to our program, um, sat around and started recording history, stories, language, just on some little cassette recorders. And the majority of those recordings in the first 200 of those recordings are all in the Salish language. Um, and it was really just sitting around and having conversation and what, what always brings tribal people together or people in general together is food. And so they just started having lunch together and had all these little recorders setting out. And the information that was recorded at the time was is, is just invaluable. And we, we are known to have one of the richest collections across the Northwest, at least, if not across the U.S. of tribal um, collections of history, oral, oral history, stories, and language. Um, this is Tony Kishula, who I mentioned, and Felicity McDonald, who Tom had the pleasure of sharing his office with for many, many years. They shared a little tiny office, so he was very, very much nurtured by her and many of the other elders and through his time working there. Um, but she continued until up into her 90s, she came to work every single day because she believed in what, um, what she thought was important, which well, you saw the slide of our mission and vision, which was to perpetuate, protect, and promote our history, language, and culture. And that's our vision at, at the Salish Cudley Sky Culture Committee. That's what our main goals are. And she, she worked every day tirelessly to um, make sure that that happened in every way that she could. These are um, a slide of our collections. And as mentioned, I worked in historical collections manager for 20 years prior to um, my current position, and these cassette tapes, there's over a thousand of them amongst um, video, old reel-to-reel -reel film that I didn't even know existed. We have gone to um, lengths to make sure that, that these different media formats have been brought up to today's standards of um, archiving, and these hard drives over here are now, that was a few years back, those are now outdated there's there's now new ways of um, preserving and protecting our our collections so that work continues and here's felicity again listening to those little cassette tapes and that is a really um demanding and, and rigorous job she put on her little headphones and and listened for hours and hours and translating and transcribing those in um recordings into into english from salish and when we do that they're not the same, that the translation is not the same from English, um, from Salish to English and vice versa. They're, they end up wording different. So for her to be able to do that um, is, is a huge undertaking. And, and she spent a lot of time and a lot of hours doing that. And these two ladies here, that there's Shirley, that if you all recall, she was here last night and did the opening, and, and her sister Dolly. These two are my grandmothers on my mother's side. And so they, they too, Shirley's our senior language translator and advisor, and the, the slide you saw before was that was Felicity McDonald, and she was our senior language translator and advisor prior to Shirley. But Shirley was also our senior language um, specialist, and Dolly Lynn Spigler served on the Elders Advisory Council after she retired, but she was um, one of the first to come on to the, um, culture committee staff when it was first um, put together in the mid-70s. And these are some of the other elders um, 
that contributed to our program over the years. And as I said there, they were made up of a, a knowledgeable, fluent speaking body of elders that um, shared their stories, um, their language, their knowledge with us through, throughout the years. And many of those are the place names and some of the, the place name projects that Tom works very, very hard on to make sure that's out there. You guys might have seen some of those, or you will see them on, your, on the tours that you may be going on in the next couple days up to the Bison Range or even around the city here. There's numerous place name signs that we have up um, explaining the rich history that we have and the rich connection that we have to this area. Is there anything else you need to mention? Oh. Do you want me to kind of pick up? Yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to Thompson now to go further into our, our history. Um, the second slide that you guys saw was our annual language and culture camp. And so we have annual events that we continue to, um, to carry on throughout the, throughout the years. And our first and foremost audience are tribal membership because as I said, when this, first, when this program first came about, um, there was a, an urgent need and recognition by our elders at the time that there was a, a change in time and they saw that there was, the language was starting to dwindle, their, the culture was starting to, there wasn't as many people um, doing, the, doing the cultural practices and so that's why that audience continues to stay very much intact or our, um, our children because they are our future and we want we want our future to be able to have our culture and our language and our history um, so we we continue to have those annual events we continue to go out and gather our foods and medicines um, we actually just wrapped up our annual language camp this last week it was it was good it was really nice it was a lot and a lot of kids so that was beautiful a beautiful thing um, and there's a lot that I'm probably not covering, but Thompson has a lot to, to offer you this, this morning. So I'm going to hand it over to him and, and be ready for, for a lot of information, a lot of good information. <laughs> I'm no city. And thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, what an honor to be here today uh, with all of you history buffs historians um, uh, and just people who are interested in, in what we might have to offer today. And you uh, received such a wonderful introduction uh, to the Culture Committee to uh, what I was mentioning uh, very briefly before Sadie arrived, that um, kind of how, th how this book came about, um, the process that we, that we pursue. And, um, the heart and soul of everything we produce, whether it's books, signs, uh, online materials, articles, uh, pamphlets, uh, it really runs the gamut. Um, the heart and soul of every one of those things are the recordings that Sadie mentioned. Um, they really are an astonishing body of, it constitutes an astonishing body of knowledge it's, um, it's not an archive we should make clear that's open to the public, but really in a sense, uh, we, we just don't have the capacity staff um, and, and uh, to, to do that. And besides, the materials do contain some sensitive information that needs to be handled carefully. Um, in fact, the reason why, uh, it's one of the reasons why it's such a rich and comprehensive collection is that, um, as Sadie mentioned, when the Culture Committee was established in the mid-70s, um, the staffing uh, was comprised of Johnny R. Lee and Clarence Woodcock and, and Sadie's uh, Yaya, Dolly Linspiegler, and Lucy Vanderberg, other people who were younger um, at that time who were um, in their 30s for the most part, um, who were fluent speakers. And so there was that climate of trust and familiarity that's so far beyond what was present when anthropologists like James Tate or Claude Schaefer or Carly Maloof or uh, others sat down with the elders. Um, not, that, uh, not that they um, didn't have friendships and good relationships, but it's just a deeper level of 
of trust, but also of communication. Sadie mentioned the difficulty of moving between Salish and English. There's so much that can be lost in that process, and that's one reason why these elders that we're so indebted to for everything we do, like Jim Felicity McDonald, the, the elder I sh had the honor to share my little office with for 15 years, or Dolly, or today Shirley, why we're so indebted to them, because it is difficult, and they go back to those recordings over and over again. There's such a, a true sense of, it's, of traditional scholarship. Um, if we can define scholarship as um, when you have a dedication to a corpus of knowledge, a body of knowledge, and a respect for it, a, a humility about it, that you can never know enough, that there's always more to learn. These elders certainly have that for the materials that they so diligently engaged with for decades. So we're really indebted to them. And, um, <clears throat> but it's not the only information that we've scoured. We've gone back through the archives across the nation and the world um, for, to access the information provided by earlier generations of elders. And so it has that asset to it, that, uh, that plus sign next to it, that it's, it's, you know, for example, the information provided by Nku Sui, one man walking Michelle Ribe, who was Chief Charlo's main translator, uh, the information this brilliant man provided to James Tate, the ethnographer who was out here, kind of the field man for Franz Boas around 1909 uh, and up into the teens. He kind of came back a number of times, but uh, provide the, the information provided by him and, and the other amazing um, ancestors on this slide, um, it, in many cases, uh, contained really detailed information of the world before the introduction of horses. And so it has a really deep value in that sense. But on the other hand, it comes to us through the filter of non-Indian writers, translators. So at every stage of that transmission process, errors can be introduced. Um, and we're aware of that. Um, but still, there's great value in this material. These are elders that um, Claude Schaefer interviewed. It's great length in the 1930s when he was on the planet reservation uh, in the course of his doctoral work. And he went on to become the first director of the Museum of the Plains Indian in Browning. Um, but Paul Antoine Chukwum Shana Sophie Moise, for whom the public hearing room in the Missoula County Courthouse is named now, uh, thanks to the wonderful outreach of David Strohmeyer, the Missoula County Commissioner, uh, Ellen Bigsan, and Victor Vandenberg. Um, and all these guys, too. <laughs> Uh, you may recognize some of these fellows, uh, David Thompson and uh, Pierre-Jean Desmet, Isaac Stevens, John Mullen, Peter Ronan, and his wife Mary Ronan. Yeah, those materials also contain crucial pieces of, of the history and culture um, and the records of the Lewis and Clark expedition too. Um, so we do uh, bring all these things into conversation with each other, but the unique thing about the culture committee because of our long, stable existence, thanks to the continued support of the Tribal Council, they should have supported us at 10 times the budget that we've had, but I'm not gonna bring that up here. <laughs> um, no, it, it was very generous considering the tribal budgets, the needs of the tribal community, their, their awareness of the centrality of importance that tribal sovereignty itself ultimately rests upon cultural continuance, a point that our city's predecessor, Tony in Cachola Sr., often made, um, and many other uh, elders have made too. Pat Pierre often uh, stressed that in his public presentations. But um, because of that long, stable existence, we're uniquely situated to bring those materials into conversation with each other. But the difference is that those university settings or research institutes around the country, the relatively few that really engage seriously with oral history or oral tradition, generally do so, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying the, the corroboration process here, so bear with me, but generally speaking, the corroboration, the direction of corroboration in those outside entities is 
the oral history is regarded more seriously if it's corroborated by the written record. Ours is, generally speaking, and again, it's an oversimplification, but it's generally the opposite direction. We take the written record seriously if it's corroborated by these men and women. Um, <clears throat> this is the gold standard of, of cultural knowledge, linguistic knowledge, and in many cases, historical knowledge. So, um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> that brings us that brings us to Lewis and Clark, and um, and engaging with this history. And as you know, um, we produced this. Uh, many of you know anyway that we produced this book published by the University of Nebraska Press. Um, it, the first edition came out, I think, 2005, and a revised edition 2019. Um, and I think it still remains one of the relatively few detailed histories of the expedition's encounter with the Native community. But I think um, most of those other examples look at the Native community and its history in, uh, kind of in the context of the expedition's history. And we do the opposite. We look at the expedition's history in the long context of Salish history. And that's, that's kind of the, um, the dirty trick. Uh, we, we pulled on all the Lewis and Clark buffs uh, in, in this book, because you know, we kind of imagine the people buy the book and they're going through and they're like, wait a minute, where's Lewis and Clark? Um, because really, it's more about the Salish world they were entering. We're trying um, our best in this book to counter what remained um, implicitly or explicitly the message of too many of the Lewis and Clark materials at the time of the bicentennial, which is what compelled us to produce this, which was the incorrect message that 1805 marks the beginning of Montana's history. No, it doesn't. Um, that's really, if we had to boil the book down to one sentence, that's it. Uh, so um, we do our best to convey that in a number of ways, and I'll, I'll kind of go into that more here. So a version of this timeline was first produced for the book. Um, it's one of the ways we try to convey that. So um, as you'll see in a moment, um, documented Salish Kalispell history in this part of the world reaches back to, you know, a long time ago. Let's put it that way. But there are, um, I'll, I'll kind of jump ahead here and then jump back. So when the elders tell the stories, we can't tell coyote stories this time of year, but when they tell them in the winter time, they begin with the beginning. And that's the stories of Sinchalet, coyote, the transformer who prepared the world for the human beings who are yet to come. And he was tasked with this duty of going across the landscape and destroying the Nafli Sket, uh, which means, which is roughly translated as monsters, but it really means those who eat human beings. And he transforms them. And in many cases, um, they are larger versions of the animals we know today. And he transforms them into, uh, the versions of the animals we know today. There's giant buffalo, there's giant beaver. And lo and behold, um, those are animals now documented in the scientific record as the megafauna, still present at the end of the last ice age. Um, they describe a strange and now vanished world, covered in snow and ice, covered in icy floodwaters. Well, that bears a striking resemblance to our tales of Glacial Lake Missoula, doesn't it? And there are too many of these coincidences, even the very locations where many of these events in the coyote stories unfold, too many coincidences for them to be coincidences. What they are in part, coyote stories are many things. They operate on a spiritual level. They teach the lessons of right and wrong, uh, oftentimes by coyote doing what's wrong, coyote being coyote. Um, but I don't want to go too far into that because we'll bring snakes into the room and I know you guys don't want that. But, but uh, there, there's too many of these coincidences so we realize that among other things, they are a memory of some of the more distant reaches of tribal history. 
And lo and behold, the archeological record matches up with this. There is the oldest documented site of human remains, and this is public knowledge, is the Anzic site, which is located along the felicitously named Flathead Creek, uh, which flows into the Shields River, which then flows into the Yellowstone River. It's been carbon dated to about 12,800 years ago, you know, a couple hundred years after the last draining of Glacial Lake Missoula. So even if we limit this, um, this kind of astonishing scope of human history here, just to when the place started to warm up a bit, nine, 10,000 years ago. And we take that and we boil it down into 20, one 24 hour day. Well, does Lewis and Clark arrive at the beginning of that day? Uh -uh. They arrive almost at the end of the day, about 11.30 PM. So all that history since Lewis and Clark, that's not the history of Montana. That's just the last half hour, the, or let's just hopefully not the last, the most recent half hour. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, you'll notice that the background picture in this is taken from, um, those of you who are, who are Missoulians, is taken from uh, above the M on Mount Sentinel, where there's a boulder there that marks the upper limit of Glacial Lake Missoula. Um, so it's really astonishing to try to get our heads around what it means for a community to have that kind of time depth in one place. What kind of set of relationships you have with the land, with the waters, with the plants and animals. And what kind of sustainability that also reflects. Um, the ability to live in one place for that long and for visitors and strangers from across the ocean to come here and pass through and regard it as untouched and pristine. Well, um, you know, I, I'm a non-Indian from New York, by the way, I should, I should mention that. Uh, and so I can say, you know, uh, my people <laughs> uh, haven't, haven't had our way of life, in, you know, in place on this continent for very long and I don't think anybody's going to arrive uh, in North America now, travel across it, and say, this is pristine. So, um, so that, that's a, a great perspective, just to keep in mind. So um, I have this little slide here. It's the only slide I have that references another work of scholarship, highly recommended. It's by a brilliant indigenous scholar from New England. Uh, named Gene O'Brien, first name and last name. And it's, you know, Agnes Vandenberg, the great famed Salish educator and elder, um, one of her favorite sayings to people was, sometimes the truth hurts. And uh, she's like, still got to tell the truth. So the truth is, um, is sometimes, you know, a little tough medicine. And I realize that um, many of you are here to, in, 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 out of respect and celebration for Lewis and Clark, and the elders never want to convey any disrespect for them, but they do want to accurately convey the impact of the expedition and its aftermath for the Salish people. And that's really what we're doing. But when we, so what we're trying to do in a sense is correct the problem that exists here that Gene O'Brien documents in New England, which is the syndrome of firsting and lasting, where the dominant society has a tendency to always mark and celebrate the first church, the first school, the first factory, the first white woman born and blah, 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 the first white boy born and blah, blah, blah. And even if it's not the intention, the effect of kind of elevating and memorializing those things is to erase what came before or to minimize it, to regard it as somehow less significant, less fully human, less worthy of our, our noting. And um, so, uh, and the last thing is the other end of that, which um, the culture committee is in the business of countering, which is sort of the vanishing race illusion 
which has been widely documented in scholarship, um, where it's the last, you know, it's Ishii in California, or it's um, Edward S. Curtis photographs conveying that these are the last of such and such. And it's not as if cultural loss doesn't occur. Sadie noted that's what propelled the elders to establish a culture committee. But guess what? Those efforts, that resistance, that um, those tireless efforts at cultural continuance have worked. The people are still here. So, so many times I've been at events where people unintentionally make remarks that are, are kind of along that lasting category there in some way or another. And I've been beside tribal people who have to kind of go, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm still here. So, um, great, very interesting book. So it's not only the scope of time that we try to convey in this book and in many of our messages, but also the scope of space, uh, the reach of Salish territories, and that this is a vast tribal homeland that straddles the continental divide. You'll see that that dotted line roughly down the middle of that map um, is that's the kind of divide, so the territories are kind of equidistant on both sides. And um, this is a deeply documented map. It's not just from uh, the recordings, it's from that conversation of materials that I mentioned before. And it's actually some of the greatest, most important work that we're gonna be bringing forward in our forthcoming atlas um, is the work that James Tate did with tribal elders about tribal territoriality, and he interviewed elders of many tribes in the, uh, all in the Northern Rockies area and plateau area, and most of that information matched up. There were relatively few places where um, he got conflicting information. So the map, the, convey, the way it conveys territory across this region, I don't know how many of you are map nerds, but I'm a total map nerd, and I can never, I can never get enough of looking at these things, but um, but that's one thing um, that I want to convey. And then we have a, just a scattering, s selected few of the place names we've documented in the course of the ethnogeography project that Sadie mentioned that grows out of the elders from the very beginning of the culture committee, uh, committee uh, stressing the importance of place names as a crucial body of cultural knowledge, that so much is boiled into them these powerful vessels of cultural knowledge and power that many of which refer back to those creation stories. So they reflect the tenure of people in those areas. Some of them reflect some way or another of the, of the um, tribal modes of subsistence that we'll discuss in a moment, you know, including, as Sadie mentioned, the name of Missoula, Inthai, or Inthai, just a place of a little bull trout, reflecting the abundance of those fish here, and also reflecting their importance in the tribal mode of subsistence. Um, so every one of the place names you see on this map and on all the other ones that we're trying to kick out into public spaces every chance we get um, is kind of like the tip of an iceberg poking out of Lake Glacial Lake Missoula. <laughs> and underneath that tip is just this massive body of years of research, of translation work, <coughs> interviewing the elders, field trips with the elders, uh, and trying to bring all that stuff together as best we can. So we try to be as rigorous as we can um, so that every one of these things has a strong foundation, a strong basis. The other thing I would just make brief note of here that again we'll touch on a little bit more in a moment is that in the white lettering are the names of the tribes or indigenous nations. And a couple of them, the Tunachan and the Sundeusa, don't exist anymore. And that's the result of changes that unfolded in the century preceding the arrival of Lewis and Clark. So we'll touch on that in a moment. Um, I would lastly just note that Tony Incashol Sr., um, the director we just lost a year ago, um, was always disciplined and insistent that the culture committee just speaks for Salish Kalispell history. And it is the, the right and the responsibility of other tribes to tell their stories. Um, so on this map, we only have the names of, of Salish and tribes within what is now the state of Montana. Um, so uh, there are other names that 
in some way kind of hint at, at the other tribes in other areas, but we, we would never um, presume to mark their territories on, on these maps. Uh, so uh, so up here, that's the Kootenai River, and that name literally means Kootenai Waters. So, a <clears throat> um, couple weeks ago, when Kim was foolish enough to invite us to come to the Mullen Road Conference, uh, one of the first things um, out the chute that we sprung on people was, I hate to tell you this, but the Mullen Road is not the Mullen Road. <laughs> and uh, I would offer the same thing here, that Lewis and Clark's Trail is not Lewis and Clark's Trail. It's one of the many ways in this book that we try to get across that basic idea that I mentioned, that history didn't begin in 1805. That when they, when they followed a trail, they were following ancient trails that have been present for thousands of years. And so there's a whole section in the book that takes readers on Lewis and Clark's trail, revealing it not to be their trail, and kind of drive home the point, instead of coming from the south end of the Bitterroot north, we go north-south. And um, this beautiful map was hand-drawn by someone who was right at the heart of the whole ethnogeography project for many years, an elder named Mike Durdlo Sr. His son, Mike Durdlo Jr., is now head of the Tribal Preservation Department. And Mike was head of that department before his son. And Mike combined the deepest knowledge of the culture, just from his, how he was raised, the family he is from, his fluency in the language. And he combined that with about 35 years of working for the BIA as a surveyor and cartographer. And so he created these just gorgeous old school hand-drawn maps uh, for many projects. And this one is featured uh, on page 40 in our book uh, at the kind of opening of that whole segment. Uh, so we, we're so grateful for Mike's um, help in this work. There he is in the, in the background of this picture. This is one of the pages from that place name section, Skalkaho, which is, uh, has been anglicized as Skalkaho. Uh, it means many trails and uh, one of the place names in that whole segment. There's Sadie a few years ago. There's Mike in the back. There's Shirley, our, our translator and uh, language advisor, and Jim and Josephine, who were ama you know, amazing translators and who've left us, but, and Mike has left us too. But I always kind of like that picture because it looks like an album cover. <laughs> Shirley and the Salish, or Jim and the Salish. Jim kind of looks like the band leader. <laughs> so um, that work, keeps coming out in all kinds of different ways. One of the things that we've, um, we first, uh, first one of these kind of signs, maps, that we did was in partnership with Milltown State Park. And it's up on the bluff. I gather the bluff is now closed uh, because of the instability of that cliff, but the first of those maps is, is or was up there. But since then, we were gradually, as time and resources allow, we're getting these up in many places around the Aboriginal territories. And so what they are, are maps of a particular part of the Aboriginal territory, along with um, information about the cultural importance of that area and its history, and kind of trying to convey that it's both a historic and continuing uh, relationship for the Salish people. Um, so this, you know, combining historic and contemporary images um, is one of the ways to do that. And some, some of these signs are, are all boiled into one sign, some are two sign sets, like this one for the Bitter Valley in stetched sweat waters of the Red Osier Dogwood. Uh, and the latest one is a three sign set because there are so many place names uh, in Sinyadaman Chelm Uum Komok, which is the Mission Valley and Mission Mountains. So this is Elder Joe Vanderberg. Um, uh, he and I traveled down to St. Mary's Mission to um, personally install the signs that are visible out there. So are you guys going down that way tomorrow? Is there a field trip? Okay, well, if you go, 
try to stop there. And they're up many other places too. This is the sign we, it's all on one side for the Missoula Valley. Uh, that's Sophie Moise, by the way, uh, digging bitterroot out near Fort Missoula in uh, 1945. Um, and one version of that sign is up here uh, in the six sign set at Bear Tracks Bridge. So we continue to document these things. This is a trip just last fall with Lucy Vanderberg, Joe's younger sister, um, to document the Lolo National Historic Trail. So she's down there, um, kind of about as close to the confluence of Lolo Creek and the Bitterroot as we could get before we ran into um, no trespassing signs, turn around or you'll be shot. Um, uh, and here is uh, Lucy up, up, you know, along some interpretive trails or signs for the Lolo Trail. So there's that scope of time, there's a scope of space. And the other thing, one of the other things we try to convey in this book and in many of our talks is this concept of ways of life that the elders always talk about. Uh, as soon as they talk about the history for more than a few minutes, it seems like one way or another, they end up trying to convey uh, this concept of ways of life and the profound differences between the, the dominant society way of life and what was here for thousands of years. Not that there wasn't historical change across such a vast period, of course there was. It's not as if historical change began with the invasion either. But um, in its broad contours, there was remarkable consistency and longevity to the traditional way of life, partly because it was so sustainable. And so one of the main concepts the elders have tried to make sure people grasp, especially you know when the, the focus of the culture community's education efforts, are, the first primary audience is always younger tribal members. The rest of us are just kind of side beneficiaries of, of the elders sharing this stuff. But, they, the elders have often talked that you know younger people really have a hard time getting their heads around um, about how different things are today from how they were. And so one of the main concepts is tribalism, that people lived collectively, they sh had relatively little private property, uh, personal, few personal belongings, um, and um, things, things were shared and done, done together. Um, and they followed a seasonal cycle of life. The people here uh, practice no agriculture. Um, and so one of the main things is bitterroot, um, which is welcomed every springtime uh, in ceremony, um, was and is. Um, and the Missoula Valley actually was probably the most important place, area, in all the Aboriginal territories for this chief of the foods, as it's been called by some of the elders. Um, so uh, that was crucial. And the next major food in the seasonal cycle was camas. And many of these places across Western Montana that were abundant in camas are remarked upon in many of those old materials as being shimmering blue lakes in June when the camas are all in bloom. And, um, that's an amazing, amazing staple food as well. These little bulbs, it's a lot of work to dig those things up uh, with using the pets as the uh, traditional digging sticks. And then to gather them in massive quantities and to put them through about a three day baking process. I don't know. Um, and in that process, it's transformed from an inedible inulin into a kind of super concentrated carbohydrate food. Um, the elders talk about it as kind of the original Indian power bar. They, you know, <laughs> elders would just have a few of them in their pocket, go hunting in the mountains all day, start dragging in the late afternoon, just pop one or two in their mouth and poof, got energy to keep going. So again, all these things um, have been done for millennia and are still done today. So that's that's digging a camas baking pit at the Longhouse during language and culture camp a few years ago. Um, of course, berries and the profusion of these things 
again, the abundance of many of these things is probably takes some effort for us to really fully reimagine. Um, and many of these things also, by the way, although it wasn't agricultural, it wasn't passive either. That um, as we've documented deeply in many materials that are out there, um, the tribal application of fire in a deliberate, careful, highly knowledgeable, sophisticated way rejuvenated these things like huckleberries, um, uh, kind of cleared areas um, for camas, um, kind of thinned out the grasses and, and things like that, um, and also kind of created these um, remarkable cultural landscapes that are reported upon by Lewis and Clark and by many other early travelers, but aren't kind of conceived of as cultural landscapes. They're thinking they're just the, the gifts of the Almighty, which of course they are, but not just that. And so just um, the other day we were uh, out at Prim, Prim Meadows yesterday. Was he just yesterday? No, day before, Monday. Yeah, so uh, we were out at Prim Meadows, which is an amazing spot, way up Gold Creek off the Blackfoot River. It's a protected grove of ponderosa pine, just a remnant, 80 acres or so. Um, but it gives us such a great little glimpse of what many of these lowland ponderosa pine forests look like uh, when the first non-Indians arrived. Um, shaped by fire, uh, which removed the underbrush and actually protected the big trees. And so, um, but that was, fire was also applied for all these other reasons. Of course, um, hunting was a crucial part of the, of the mode of subsistence. Um, that's a Curtis photograph of Sophie Moisa as a young woman drying meat, old school dry meat rack. And, and there's uh, drying meat at hunting camp just a few years ago. And fishing. So fishing is often under, underestimated, underrecognized in the overall mode of subsistence. Um, it's often, you know, salespeople are often talked about as, ah, uh, they're not fish eaters. <laughs> They, they, want, they want, you know, buffalo or deer or elk. Um, and it's true that from what I gather from the elders, that, that's the preferred meat over fish. But fish was good too. Um, but also, it played a crucial role in the overall mode of subsistence. So one of the ways that this way of life was so reliable was because of the fish. So when you read Lewis and Clark's journals, or you read the Mullen journals, or Isaac Stevens, or the fur trade, or the missionaries, you'll run in again and again into reports of abundance one day and scarcity the next. Um, oh, we ran into a gigantic herd of buffalo. It took us all day to get, get through them. Two days later, we haven't seen any game for days. Um, you know, or, you know, and of course, many of these plant foods had, occur in pulses. Uh, bitterroot are only ready to be dug for a couple weeks uh, before the, the roots become kind of too woody to be able to peel easily. The berries, of course, come and go um, in relatively brief periods of time. The camas um, are mostly dug in June, although the super knowledgeable ladies could dig them any time of year, but they were smart enough to be able to distinguish camas from death camas even when the bloom wasn't present. I mean, that takes some deep plant knowledge. But the point is that um, many of these foods um, kind of present the problem that the anthropologist Wayne Suttles called coping with abundance, where hunter-gatherer, fisher people have to develop these sophisticated ways of not only harvesting, but also drying or otherwise storing these foods for consumption when they weren't present. But the thing that made the whole thing more relaxed and reliable in these territories were fish. So in all those old journals, although they report abundance one day and scarcity the next for many of these foods, when it comes to fish, it's like every body of water is teeming with fish. You hear that word teeming over and over again in the descent records, in the Lewis and Clark records, the fur trade, Bond on Stevens, uh, and, and this is almost every little body of water, every creek, every river, every lake, in every corner of Salish Cowspell territories. And so there are 
lots of um, incidents that I, I've always found kind of entertaining where a non-Indian party is traveling along with some Salish or Kalispell guides and they start to run out of food and they start to freak out and they cannot figure out why the tribal guys are so chill. They're just relaxed. They're like, what are you guys worrying about? And um, they're like, they're too primitive and stupid to realize we're almost out of food. And it's like, uh, so again and again, what happens is the tribal guys disappear for a day or half a day, a few hours, and then they come back and bring into camp a couple long strings of trout or other fish. And that's, that's that deep knowledge. That's why they were relaxed. They, they knew almost wherever they were, they could um, obtain fresh, high quality protein when needed. And um, in fact, this is something also that comes out in both the written record and the oral histories that the location of the winter camps was chosen specifically uh, because they were places known to have good ice fishing all through the winter months. So pretty, as the elders would say, pretty CCUs, pretty smart. Uh, so fishing, of course, still today too, and suffusing the whole cyclical <laughs> way of life um, were spiritual traditions. And everything was um, part of, of kind of interlinked with, with a spiritual connection to these places. This is the medicine tree down in the Bitter Valley. And of course, the trip's still made today. So, Lewis and Clark arrived in a world vastly different from the world that existed just a century before they got here. And there were three huge elements of Euro-American culture um, and <coughs> ways of life that arrived here through intertribal exchange well in advance of non-Indians themselves. One was horse. Um, there's been some recent scholarship um, making the argument that horses were always here, they never went away, um, and saying that um, there aren't any tribal histories to reflect otherwise, and we beg to differ. Um, we have probably four or five different, um, maybe half a dozen uh, different detailed accounts by elders uh, both in our recordings and in older materials telling about the introduction of horse, the acquisition of horse by Salish and Castle people. Probably different bands got them at different times. Um, and so um, we think that it was probably in the sometime around 1700. Um, Francis Haynes back in the 30s um, documented well that the Blackfeet acquired horses about 1730, and they acquired them from the Salish through raids on the Salish. So horses transformed things. Obviously, you could travel faster and farther, carry more stuff, um, and you could also make incursions into the territories of other nations more easily. Um, and sometimes they were, were friendly, and sometimes they were not. So they increased. Um, interaction quite a bit. Um, many of the elders told earlier ethnographers that prior to horses, um, even interaction with very friendly, close you know, tribes we were, the Salish were intermarried with, like the Nez Perce, uh, were, was relatively infrequent, um, became much more frequent after, after the introduction of horses. So there were good and bad in, in that increased interaction. The second thing that I want to mention, although we're not sure whether it was second after horses in chronology, is the arrival of non-native diseases, especially smallpox. This awful picture is from the last documented smallpox epidemic on the Flathead Reservation in 1901 um, at a quarantine camp along Mission Creek. Um, so um, smallpox, it's hard to get our heads around just what an impact that was and to what, how much effort we really need to put into trying to reconstruct tribal life before those diseases, especially populations. 
So smallpox around the world occurs in two main strains, variola minor and variola major. And one of them has an average mortality rate around the world quite high. Remember, COVID's mortality rate was something like 1%. Smallpox, the lesser one, is like 20%. I'm going off the top of my head here. And the, and the more severe variant, like 50%, which is just ugh, uh, bad. Um, but when smallpox interacted with indigenous people and possibly just the genetic interaction between the virus and people in the Americas, um, it assumed two kind of variant forms. One was called hemorrhagic smallpox and the other was called flat lesion smallpox. And both of these have had documented mortality rates exceeding 90%. And the one, I think it was the flat lesion, had almost 100%. It was like 95% or more. So, and this is, this is backed up in lots of different records, including oral histories. There's, um, not, not to present my, I'm not presenting myself, by the way, throughout this as anything but a student of all these things and doing my best to pass along what the elders have passed on to us. Um, but I'm, I'm even more so not an expert in the history of other tribes, but I have come across a Kootenai account where there was one survivor from an entire band. So um, what does this mean for us trying to reconstruct the populations of these nations, say, pre-1700? Well, um, I'm <laughs> we've been wrestling with that. It's hard, it's a difficult problem. Historical demographers have been wrestling with it and debating each other. It really exploded into the academic world after the publication of a, a really fascinating book by a wonderful man named Henry Dobbins back in the early 80s called Their Numbers Become Thin, in which he made the argument that after the introduction of smallpox by the conquistadors in Mexico in the, mid, in the early 1500s, like 1520s, uh, that spread through intertribal contact throughout the Americas with devastating impacts. And then other historians came back and said, well, there's just not evidence to support that. You know, so it's, it kicked off a big debate. But um, there were sudden, the archeological record has revealed that there were sudden unexplained increases in the number of burials in the central Columbia Plateau in the mid 1500s. Does that reflect that? It might, I, I don't know. We, no one knows, I don't think, uh, for certain. But for sure we have documented lots of documented evidence, stories, detailed stories, all kinds of evidence of epidemics that struck here uh, in the 1700s. For sure there was one in the 1781-82 period, which is part of a, a continent-wide pandemic um, that's been chronicled by a great historian from Colorado named Elizabeth Fenn called Pax Americana, um, highly recommended. Um, and uh, but there may, it appears that there were epidemics before then too. There are Sioux winter counts of epidemics there in the 1730s. And, you know, it's not too far a jump through intertribal contact from, from there over into central Montana. Um, so what that, the way the sailors responded to that was before that time, they were organizing at least half a dozen big bands. Uh, mostly east of the Continental Divide, actually, um, based in places like Merchette, Helena, um, and uh, Tibet, uh, Three Forks, and uh, a place with the little Hawthorns, uh, Bozeman, Gallatin area, um, and Skumps uh, uh the Big Hole, uh, play, uh, Waters of the Pocket Gopher, uh, and uh, Sintop K, which is Butte, so just this side of the Kano Divide, um, meaning place where they shot something in the head. And the elders have, um, have said that was because the bull trout in a world swimming in bull trout, Silver Bow Creek was so crystal clear and the bull trout so enormous that they could harvest them in that unusual way. So imagine 
what a, in one word, C.K., how that encapsulates the environmental history of Western Montana over the last century and a half. Um, in the 1890s, a U.S. Fishery Commission scientist named Barton Everman went to Butte um, and the Upper Clark Fork at the Upper Clark Fork in Deer Lodge, he seen the river and said there's virtually no aquatic life whatsoever, not even insects. And then he went further upriver to Butte to Silver Bow Creek and said, um, the creek has the consistency of a thick sludge. There's no life whatsoever. That's in Tom K, a place, kind of a different picture before that. But um, so the other thing about about diseases, though, that I think it's important for us to recognize is as grim and horrifying history as it is, it's also something that for the Salish and Kalispell and other indigenous nations, um, oddly, a matter of pride. Because imagine taking a hit like that, where there are 20 people sitting in a big lodge, and in an instant, 19 of them are gone. And yet, not only do you survive as a nation, as a political entity that's sovereign, but you also survive culturally. The language, the culture, the coyote stories, the songs and dances, that the knowledge is so well shared because of that tribalism, because of that collective nature of life, that they were able to pass it on um, to whoever was left. <laughs> Um, and that's an amazing, that's a real lesson for our society today, that kind of resilience. I don't think we'd have that kind of resilience in our society today if all of a sudden 90 some percent of our people were gone. Um, who knows how we would continue. So these are some of those work winter counts uh, from the Sioux uh, tribes, the Lakota, um, that are held at the National Anthropological Archives. The third element that arrived before Lewis and Clark were firearms. And they arrived um, through some of the Hudson Bay Company posts in the upper Saskatchewan, um, where the Blackfeet got access to them a full generation before the Salish did, when David Thompson finally established um, a trading post at, uh, at what's now called Thompson Falls. Um, the name in, in Salish is Kaithkum, which means a place, uh, a place of the sound of falling water. Cake, cake, cake. Um, but it was only at that point in 1809 that the sailors got gone. So for whatever, 34 years, um, the main adversary, tribal adversary, had guns and the Salish and Kalispell did not. Um, so that had a big impact on things too. So it was the combined effects of smallpox, massively reducing the Salish population and these intensifying much more deadly conflicts with tribal enemies that led the Salish to consolidate into one main winter camp and concentrate in the Bitter Valley. So this, the Bitter Valley was always a part of Salish territory. It's kind of the westernmost <coughs> valley of Salish territory, but they decided to concentrate there for security. Uh, and so when Lewis and Clark arrived, that's where they were based uh, primarily. And, you know, subsequently that's reflected in the missionary records. You know, that's where St. Mary's Mission was established and so on. But many of those um, records don't understand that that was basically a, a, an adjustment that reflected a, a big you know, this is a characteristic of the Salish people is their adaptability, flexibility, doing what they need to do in order to continue. And um, they don't understand that. And that um, actually, as we get into the mid-19th century, the records are also clear that the Salish begin to reassert and reestablish their strength and presence in some of those old easterly territories uh, around places like Three Forks. How it would have turned out, we don't know, because that's right when Isaac Stevens and all that stuff arrived. Um, so that's the world that Lewis and Clark um, showed up uh, and encountered, um, almost all of which was kind of, they were oblivious to, not blaming them. But it's the problem when we rely upon their records um, to understand these things uh, 
beyond a certain point. And as, as, as dramatic as those changes of the 1700s were, of smallpox, of uh, the impact of horses, both good and bad, uh, of firearms, as dramatic as those impacts were, Lewis and Clark were really sent here to initiate uh, even more transformative change. Because as much as anything else, um, in fact, if you look at the establishing legislation that funded the expedition, uh, their main purpose was commercial. It's said right there in the title of the legislation that scientific inquiry was thrown in there too, but it was, and I think that was probably Jefferson's main interest, but it was by the, the authorization of Congress, not the main thing. The main thing was to catalog what was out there and to facilitate the encroachment of the American fur trade, the expansion of the American fur trade into these areas. And that is what happened. And many of these early fur traders, as I'm sure you guys know better than I do, um, <clears throat> turned to Lewis and Clark's records uh, to aid and uh, Salish people would probably say aid and abet uh, uh, their incursions. And the reason I say even more transformative is that um, this was the first introduction of the market into this part of the world. The first time that beaver were not looked at as beaver anymore, but as money. And in time, as the um, capacity for transport increased, especially with the railroad, that commodification of the natural world then extends into all kinds of other areas, timber, ore from the mountains, agricultural products, and so on. And that really is a process of transformation. And um, but it, so there's, you know, these concepts are really crucial to kind of reframing our understanding of the historical meaning of the expedition in a way that really engages respectfully and fully with indigenous nations. This concept of invasion, the concept of transformation, and also the concept of resistance. And sometimes that's outright resistance, like when the fur traders were, um, had to turn themselves into <coughs> fur brigades, these kind of armed paramilitary units to uh, pursue their objectives. Um, because of the, the armed resistance of some tribal groups in the Northern Rockies and adjoining areas. But in other areas, resistance, especially for the Salish, because of their delicate geopolitical position, took the form of continuance. Um, the non-Indian authorities did not want the Salish to continue practicing the traditional ways. I mean, and this be this is sometimes implicit and sometimes quite explicit. Um, oh, probably don't have time to get into all that history today, but it's an amazing, vivid, uh, incredible history. But in many cases, resistance took the form of continuance. Simply by continuing to do these things, um, they, were, they were resisting that transformation. And <clears throat> So we're, we're right at 1020, I better, I better stop. So yes. um, yeah, and we'll have some, some discussion here. So last thing I wanted to just call your attention to is if you go to our website, which is csktsalish.org, you can um, hear the audio of all the or, uh, oral histories that are included in the book and all the place names too, by the way. Tony and Cashola recorded them for us and they're available there on that website. You go to csktsalish.org and then cl click on the audio tab and you'll, you'll find that. So, thank you everyone, that's all. Before we open it up for questions, I also just wanted to say lem lunch to everybody, thank you. Um, for having us here and asking us to be a part of the conversation. And just as Thompson was talking about um, stewards of the land, um, being good stewards of the land for sustainability um, for all of us, it's also equally important, I think, um, to be good stewards of history. And so I appreciate all of you for 
your stewardship for history, and I hope that you're able to leave today with a little bit more than you came with. Um, <clears throat> we have a responsibility in that stewardship to carry forth this history to avoid uh, miscommunication and misunderstanding, and instead be able to have understanding, a cohesive understanding for our future generations. And so I think we have that responsibility to, um, to carry that forward and make sure that that's there for our younger generations to have. So with that, thank you. And are there any questions? I think those of us who study loose in our history understand their dependence on Native America and making their way here and back. Uh, it's just that their journals didn't always reflect that. So I think it's really great to start to know their names, start to know where they came from, and some of the cultural setting that they operated in. Um, my question is a pretty basic one. I'm from the area of Coast State, the land of the Suquamish. And um, it's a very basic question. Is there any relationship between the Coast Salish and the Salish West? The Indian Salish? Yeah, we're about the same, well, sister-speaking Salish language families, and so there's there is some some relation there. Do you speak with Shitsit or a variation? No, a, not a variation. Of, okay. Ours is is different. Okay. There, the Salish language family is pretty pretty a pretty big Salish language family, um, and there's small differences and then the further you go west, the bigger those differences are. So, yeah. In the late 1940s, I lived in Missoula and I remember the uh, tribe uh, pitching their teepees west of Russell Street on the flat there and digging better. And it gives an idea of how things have changed yeah. in a relatively short time. But uh, my question is, do they still do that? Does the tribe still dig the bitter roots? Yes, we do. We do the bitter root. Um, we do primarily dig bitter root now in the um, Cambridge Perry Hot Springs area. Um, and that's actually, there was a photo in there in the slideshow, and that's usually our first uh, ceremony, that's like, uh, I don't know how to say it, like a... Uh, first foods. Like a chief of our foods, our first foods. So that's the first food that we harvest for the year. Um, and after that first ceremony, then we're open to um, gather the rest of our foods and medicines for the year. But the, the bitter is the main staple for our food um, system. So yeah, we continue to go out and, and dig bitter root and we primarily do that with a with a group, and then um, have the blessing. And then after that, um, families will go out on their own and into their own areas where they choose to go. And um, they have been a lot more people have been coming down um, to the southern area, down into the Bitterroot, over towards Butte areas. But most of the families have <coughs> places they like to go where their families have gone in the past. So they yeah they still continue to do that. To follow up on the language question, you run the language camps. Do people from, let's say, the Spokane or the Yakima or Kootenai in the North, do they come into your camps or trying to revitalize their people and their language skills? Um, they, they, the Kootenai language is very different than ours. Um, so they have, they put on their own camps, but there's a big celebrating Salish conference that happens over with the um, Kalispell tribe, and so our our languages are more similar. So we we do a lot of work with them, and um, our we work on curriculum together and do a lot of translation work together that way. Um, but our camps are open, so anybody that wants to come can come. But we also have a. We're in, in about five years with a, language, a brand new language program. We've got about five cohorts that have gone through here in September. We'll be bringing another 
cohort of about 10 students, and they go through an um, intensive language program that's two years, and there's three levels of curriculum, and so that's a part of our language revitalization efforts, is they're going through those, that language program. The language camp that we have is language and culture, and that's, um, it's a week long. It's, we hope that um, they're able to take away from that for the people that aren't able to um, have, go to language classes, but that's such a short amount of time and you know, it, they get really basic, um, basic uh, greetings and phrases from just that camp. It's still something, so it's good, but that immersion is really where it's at, so. You got a question, sir? Yeah, is the uh, Salish language, is that the Paskin based or Algonquin? Neither. 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 <laughs> really? Yeah, it's a large family in its own right with, I think, uh, 20, around 25 or 30 separate languages and 75 dialects and sub dialects reaching from here to the Pacific Coast, right? Yeah. I think we'll it's a um, Venusian language, I believe. Take anybody that wants to stay for a minute if you too would be willing to answer any more questions because sure. it's time for us to wrap up. Okay. So, can I do this for one second? Thank you both so much. so much today and uh, it's so impressive to hear someone speak uh, Salish too. It's like, yeah, he's Whoa. learned. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple words. Yes, and I have a teeny little gift for both of you oh. as an appreciation well, thank you. for coming to oh. do this and I hope you all have a just delightful rest of your conference. It's uh, such a privilege for me to be here too. So, anyway.